hello. Hello, it's so good to see, it's so good to see all of you here today. Can you hear me? Can you hear me in the back? Good, good, good. So welcome. This is our seventh annual season of giving, and it's one of my personal favorite talks at 12. And I'd like to in particular welcome all of those, all of our friends who are watching through our live stream. If you're not here with us today in the Harvard Medical School Auditorium, we invite you to participate by asking your questions. You can post your questions in the YouTube or Facebook comment section, and you will be very much a part of this special event. The Season of Giving is an annual giving campaign that is brought to you by the shared good work of the Harvard Longwood campus. I want to recognize those whose efforts are helping bring your generosity to others. Kate McDaniel from Harvard Medical School, Judith Vance, Judith? Judith Vance from the Harvard School of Dental Medicine, and Linda Picard with the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you and your teams for all of your extraordinary work. Um, as Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, the purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. By being useful and compassionate, the lives of others are enriched for sure. And there's a bonus. There's mounting scientific evidence that generosity has a rebound effect. And those who, alt who give also benefit both physically and mentally. When supporting others through good deeds or even generous kind words, you activate areas in the brain that contribute to your own happiness. Research also, sh also shows that volunteering and finding meaningful ways to give back to your community will lower your stress levels. And we know that lower stress levels may lead to healthier and perhaps even longer lives. Today we're offering four important and meaningful opportunities by which to pay forward our own abundance and helping others in the, inter in the process celebrate the season. First, we invite you to send a thank you note to colleagues who may have enriched your work this past year with a kindness, either large or small. If you have ever received one of the season of giving thank you notes, you will know that the good feeling resonates long after the season has ended. Either jot someone a note by email or download an electronic card from the Season of Giving website. Or before the day ends, just take a moment and say thank you to, some, to one person who may have helped you in the past day or month or year. Second, please consider participating in a food drive to benefit our local community. You may donate anytime now through November 27th. The food drive is organized in partnership with Action for Boston Community Development. Third, you can also brighten the season for children of all ages in the Boston area by participating in our toy drive. We recommend donating new, unopened books, games, toys, art supplies, and sports equipment. The toy drive will run from December 3rd through December 19th. It is sponsored in collaboration with the Phillips Brook House. Fourth, your donation of clothing and winter coats in particular, winter coats are very much in need, will benefit our clothing drive that will run from January 15th to 17th. This is being sponsored in collaboration with Boomerangs, a family of Boston area thrift stores. Collection boxes for the food, clothing, and toy drives will be found throughout the three schools. And you don't have to remember all of the, the dates. Just please Google and find on our website the Season of Giving site, which will have all the information and dates. And now I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. Robert Brooks, who will discuss the extraordinary power of resilience. When I think of resilience, I'm reminded of the powerful example of actor Christopher Reeve, who suffered a devastating spinal cord injury and whose every breath was dependent on a respirator. 
Not only did Christopher Reeve find purpose in his life by establishing a foundation to improve the lives of those with spinal cord injuries, but he was also known to have expressed his own resilience with these words. I'm not living the life I thought I would lead, but it does have meaning, purpose. In it, there is love, there is joy, there is laughter. There is much we can learn from the example of Christopher Reeve and from Dr. Brooks. For more than 35 years, Dr. Brooks has lectured internationally to audiences of parents, educators, and mental health professionals on topics ranging from motivation to family relationships, balancing personal and professional lives to the importance of having gratitude in our lives. He currently serves as a part-time assistant professor of psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and as a psychiatry consultant at McLean's Hospital. Dr. Brooks has received several distinguished awards for his work and is the author or co-author of 17 books. The most recent is Reflections on Mortality, Insights into Meaningful Living. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Brooks. Thank you. Thank you for that lo lovely introduction. I also want to thank you, Barbara. It's just been a pleasure to work uh, with you and the whole issue of season of living. I, I, giving, I just can't believe uh, I was actually going to quote Christopher Reeve, and we haven't even uh, talked in advance about that. This is going to be, I'm going to ha have to be very resilient because I'm going to share with you 35 to 40 year career in about 40 minutes. So I speak very rapidly. I hope uh, you, you know, be able to follow. But the good news is, on my website, I write a monthly article. I started in about 1999. If there's a particular topic you're interested in, you'll probably find briefer articles. It's totally free to subscribe. And it, uh, so you can come up to me afterwards. I could even suggest some articles. Although I always like to tell people when I uh, first uh, went to uh, get a website address many years ago, I typed in as my URL, Robert Brooks, it's my name. Have any of you ever tried to get an email address and it comes back, it says it's taken already someone else? I was so young and naive, I get this uh, email back, your name is taken. And I remember I said, who took it? It was like identity <laughs> theft. And I said, Robert Brooks is a common enough name, but I should have known, I'm a very big sports fan, and there used to be a wonderful player on the Green Bay Packers whose name is Robert Brooks. The other Robert Brooks is a very handsome, muscular, African-American man who is also a gospel singer. If you do not type in drbrooks.com, you'll go to his homepage where he appears without a shirt on, <laughs> muscles bulging, singing gospel. Don't do it here, please. <laughs> Sing gospel, which I thought was kind of neat till someone wrote to me and said, you look so much better on your website than in real life. So. <laughs> If you want to see a very handsome man sing the gospel, don't type in doctor. If you want to read some articles related to today's talk, you'll have to. And you know what? You could do both. So let me get going, because I really want to share with you a lot. Um, when I first started, I want to talk just a little about re resilience and a resilient mindset. As uh, in my career as a psychologist, uh, I worked in the inner city of Boston for a number of years. Most of my career was at McLean Hospital, which is, you know, a psychiatric hospital. And I became very interested in the following topic. I was trained at a time when most psychologists were trained in what we call a deficit model, basically looking at what's wrong with people and how do you fix things. And I had this transformation now almost 35 years ago that I said, you know, I think I've spent much too much time focusing on what's wrong with people, and I really have to start looking at what are the strengths and beauty of uh, uh, people. And I also, I started asking this question. I'll probably pose more questions than I'll be able to answer. I started wondering, I wondered as a psychologist, uh, as, as a father, as a husband, you know, different ways, how does a person who is resilient, and let me tell you, it's a very complicated, concept. 
I edited a book called The Handbook of Resilience in Children, and I was amazed at the different definitions people have of resilience. I'm going to use it, hopefully, in, in not an overly simplistic way. Resilience, for me, it really is the capacity to bounce back from adversity. It doesn't mean you're not going to face adversity, but when adversity comes up, like you heard that beautiful quote from Christopher Reeve, you really look at how you are going to cope with it. I always say resilient people see problems as things to be solved rather than overwhelmed by. So what I did was, and this was a very exciting part of my career, I could spend hours on this, I asked how does a resilient child or adult see the world differently from one who's not? Because I wanted to th think in this way, if parents said to me, how can we raise a resilient child, what was I to say? What were specific things? As a therapist, meeting with people of all ages, what are the strategies I wanted to use so people could be more resilient? So I called it a resilient mindset, but mindsets then get translated into actions, and that's why it's also a resilient lifestyle. So I've written about many different components, but I want to share with you in the time I have five basic components that I think go into being res uh, resilient. And the good news is none of this is easy. That may be, one could say that's the bad news, but you know what the good news is? The good news is if we start, there are really some wonderful things we could do to enhance resilience in our own lives as well as in others. And why, speaking in terms of the season of giving, as you'll hear, and it just really uh, builds on what Gina said, uh, what more and more research is showing, and I'll share with you some of my own, <laughs> that one of the most important things in being resilient is when you feel you make a difference in the life of someone else. And I'm not talking about compassion fatigue. I'm talking about you make a difference. It really helps you to be resilient, and it benefits the other people as well. So let me start with the first one, uh, thing is this. And if you go to, my, <coughs> again, I'll mention my website. There are a number of articles on my website about what I call personal control. Resilient people, as it says here, resilient people focus on what they have control over. Some of you may see it says similar to the serenity prayer, and do not spend a lot of time on things over which they have little control. As I look back in my 40-year career as a therapist, I will tell you, there are so many unhappy people who are still waiting for their happiness by someone else changing first. I've done a fair bit of marital therapy. A couple came in once to see me. I actually said, so what will help the marriage? I always like to ask that. And the wife looked at me, looked at her husband, looked back at me, and I'm not even sure she truly appreciated what she's saying. She said, I'd be in a good marriage if I wasn't married to him. <laughs> I mean, think about that. I, <clears throat> I do a lot of work with schools. So a teacher said to me once, I would really be a good teacher if I didn't have students like this. <laughs> Duh. But you know what? One of the worst, I'll, well, let me put this positive. No, I'll to be truthful. <laughs> <laughs> I always like to ask people, like, tell me one or two of the best moments you've ever had in life or your job and one or two of the worst moments. So I'll tell you, one of the toughest times was when I really went to work at McLean Hospital. My first job was as principal of the school in the locked door unit of the child and adolescent program. So what happens is, well, I, I burned out after a few weeks, but that's, we'll talk about it. That's why I got interested in resilience in adults as well. So what happens is a child or adolescent would be admitted, and the next day they came to my school. I would read the records. And you know what I would say? Dear Lord, I couldn't tell people this for a while, right? And with, I said, oh, this is being streamed, so it's everywhere. Okay, I, I, would, I, would, I would say, dear Lord, why are we getting kids like this? There must be another program somewhere else in the world. Why here? I am principal of a school in a locked door unit of a psychiatric hospital. Who did I think was going to come in? Some sweet, passive kid knocking on the door saying, I've waited all my life to be locked up. Can you please take me? I mean, it's very interesting. But I want to mention a couple of, uh, actually, I'm going to mention a few books as well. There's so much sadness when I speak to a 50-year-old and they're still moaning and groaning about uh, or holding a grudge from 30 years and still waiting for an apology. We have control over only one person in this world, and you know who that is? Ourselves. And by the way, 
I'll say this quietly, sometimes I even question that. <laughs> Do we really? And it's very important, just to give you a few examples, there are so many people who still have the attitude, why me? I've always <clears throat> been interested in both children and adults who struggle <clears throat> you know, with learning. <clears throat> and I still uh, remember some of the research done by a psychologist, Paul Gerber. He looked at adults with learning disabilities who were doing very well in life. He looked at adults who were not doing very well in life. And he said, can I distinguish them? He looks at all these variables. You know what's the main thing? The adults who were doing very well in life long ago gave up the feeling, why did I have to be born with a learning disability? It's held me back. They gave that up, and instead, you know what they said? I had no control over being born with a learning disability. What I have control over is how I respond to it. One of the things I learned, many things happen in our lives we have no control over, but we do have control over our response and attitude uh, towards things. The adults with learning disabilities who are doing poorly, they could be 55, you know what they were saying? 60 years old, why did I have to be born this way? So they were constantly in a victim mentality. And you know, my work as a therapist, if you ever talk to some of my patients, they would say, I know exactly what he's gonna talk about. What do you have control over? Now, it was very interesting. I, don't, I didn't know Gina was gonna mention Christopher Reeve. I have an article on Christopher Reeve because he gave an interview and I was stunned. You know, he said, when I became quadriplegic, at first I wondered why me? And then he said, I could still write, I could still direct, I could still, and he goes on and on. I could still help people. And I'm saying, what an amazing attitude. But then he said something else in this interview, which was incredible. He said, one of the things I've learned from what happened is paralysis is a choice. And I remember saying, what do you mean it's a choice? You fell off a horse and you're paralyzed. And he says something fascinating. He said, I know able-bodied people who are paralyzed. They, they, they always have a victim mentality. They do not help. And I, you know, the notion, he was involved in spinal cord injury, but he was involved in environmental causes to his dying day. And he goes on and on. He said, you see, paralysis is a choice. And one of my all-time favorite books, which I will mention, have you ever read a book and say I should reread it, but then you see the 60 books you haven't read yet? Has that ever happened to you? But for the seventh time this summer, I read this book. If you haven't read it, I would strongly recommend it. It's to this point. It's Viktor Frankl's book called Man's Search for Meaning. It is probably one of the most spiritual, meaningful books I ever read. Viktor Frankl was a psychiatrist whose whole family was wiped out in the Holocaust. He was in a concentration camp. The first half of the book is his experience in the concentration camp. The second half is about this fascinating form of therapy he developed called logo and meaning therapy. He has a quote in there, you'll see it. I, told him, I almost know it verbatim, but I'd probably butcher it a little. He said, even in the concentration camps, there are a few brave men, and I'm sure in the women's section, a few brave women who would give away their last morsel of food to someone who, who was even more hungry than they were. They proved the Nazis could take anything away from you but the last of the human freedoms to choose your attitude in any given set of circumstances. First time I read that, I actually teared up because I said, he's saying even in hell, we can decide what we want to do. It's a very powerful thing. So here's a little free therapy. Are you ready? I'm not even taking your insurance, so it's free. When you get home, Write down three things you would like to see different in your life, okay? Three things. Next to it, put down whether someone else has to change first for you to realize those three things. And here's the free therapy. If any of us are looking for our happiness by someone else changing first, forget it. Get rid of that. Instead, look at what you could do. It is an amazing thing because it frees you up. And this whole notion of personal control I could spend, well, any of these, I could spend hours on. But whenever I hear, you know, if only I had a better boss, if only this, if only this, if only this, it's not gonna work that way. If you don't have a boss you like too much, you have a choice. You either continue working there and, and uh, find ways of dealing with a boss, or you leave. I mean, I'm just being very straight about this. 
And uh, I have found, because in my own personal life, uh, the death of a couple brothers, one, tr you know, both tragically, what you have to do is how do you make meaning of this? What do you do with it? And uh, it's not easy. If it is, I could see everyone for one therapy session and things would change. But we have to give up this notion that, you know, waiting for someone else to change first. Zooming ahead, the second area is this. <clears throat> we know from so much research now, uh, and Gina certainly indicated this, and that's why a season of giving for me is so important, is that it is very difficult to be resilient if you don't have connections with other people. And but I'm talking about positive connections, not some of the ones I've seen in therapy. And uh, oh, that's a whole other talk. OK. But one of the things over the years which I became more interested in, and little did I know has become a big topic in the last year or two, is the notion of loneliness. You know, when I, when some of the initial writings on loneliness had to do a lot with senior citizens and the elderly. But now we know, I, to give you an example, it could be at any age. I was seeing a young man in therapy. I'd started to see him in his adolescence, and he was someone who had, had a number of medical issues, and he was someone who basically psychologically lost his adolescence in terms of going out and whatever. And I'll never forget the day, he must have been about 20 years old, he came in, and he said, in one sense, physically, he was feeling better. And then he just started to cry in my office. And he said, but I feel so lonely. And it was at that moment that you realize, when you're with someone who you've known for a while, you realize the pain he was experiencing at that particular moment. As a matter of fact, to some of you know, Theresa May, the Prime Minister of England, she appointed a new minister this year. Never, they never had this minister. Does anyone know what the minister was? I'm sorry, what? No. Loneliness. Maybe a happiness is the other side of the coin. Loneliness. I said, a minister of loneliness. And you know why? Research showed, I wrote an article on this. I don't know how they did this research. Some of you may know. Being lonely is like smoking 15 cigarettes a day. I looked, I don't know how they did it, but you'll see one of my articles. So one of the things, Theresa May, I'll be very interested in seeing what the outcome is, said it is a major mental health and physical health issue. So what, what does this mean? It doesn't mean you have to have 100 friends, but I became much more aware of who do we turn to. Why is this important? In all the research that's been done about resilience, when you ask people who have overcome adversity, people who've been in war zones, people who grew up abused. It doesn't matter, people who grew up under racism and poverty and now as adults are doing relatively well in life, and you say to them, I could have never predicted based on how you were growing up that you would be as hopeful and as optimistic as you are today. What do you think was the most important thing in your childhood or adolescence to help you overcome some of this? Number one answer in every study was and it's a very spiritual answer. There was at least one person along the way who truly believed in me and stood by me. And the late Julius Siegel, who was one of my heroes in psychology, who wrote a lot about resilience, he used a term in an article 30 years ago. He called it, that person a charismatic adult. Some people aren't thrilled by the word charismatic, but his definition is nothing short of poetic. He says, a charismatic adult is an adult from whom another person gathers strength. So we all need people in our lives in terms of from whom we gather strength. And more and more, and you don't need research to show this, in my clinical work, more and more, I want to know who do people turn to? Like that young man, he was so lonely. Actually, it was a lot what happened Sometimes, you, as a therapist, things work out very well. I said, how, do you, how are you going to meet someone? He said, I really want to start dating. He had never dated. And he said, I'm not into the bar scene. I said, many of us are not. And I said, well, what do you like to do? What's, what's something you could do where you really don't have to speak too much, but there'll be other people around? He was very politically oriented, so he went to work on a political campaign. So he met some people. And then he loves to read. 
And he says, you know, a lot of bookstores have authors who come to read the books, and they actually draw a big crowd. So he comes back after the first reading. He said, he was so excited, I met a, I, I met a young woman. I'm actually going out on a date. <laughs> he was funny. He said, what do you do? <laughs> I said, go somewhere. Go, I don't know, go out to eat or something. Two weeks later, he said, I have a problem now. Anyone know what the problem was? He met a second woman. <laughs> They've been together 10 years. I don't know if they'll ever get married, but he said, it's just so nice having someone on that. But if we really want to have good relationships, one of the things we have to look at is the whole issue of empathy. You know, one of my all-time favorite books was Daniel Goleman's book, Emotional Intelligence. Daniel Goleman said, more important than IQ is what he called the EQ. And he said, if you want to really have good relationships, you really have to look at empathy. What is empathy? The ability to put yourself inside the shoes of another person and see the world through their eyes. Brene Brown says, empathy is what leads to connectedness. It's a very important thing. So here's three questions. I'll put them on quickly. I the best way I could say this is, do you know every time you're with someone, they form images and words to describe you? Some of you are here, you know each other, right? Don't look at each other. This is how really anxiety builds up. Do you know everyone you're sitting next to has words to describe you? So this is important. As much as I kid about this, these are actual exercises I'll, I'll do when I, when I work with a manager or something. When I talk to a parent, I'll say to parents, what words would you hope your children use to describe you? What words would you hope your colleagues use to describe you? And then I'll always say, what do I say on a regular basis so they're likely to use these words? I always love it when someone says, I, 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 I hope my kids say whatever, you know, whatever it may be that I'm really very nice. I love some of these words. And then you talk to the kids and say, are you kidding? <laughs> What words were they actually used? And why would they use it? You know, these are the kinds of questions. Because one of the things we have to remember is this. If connections are very strong, and Goldman is right about empathy, I don't think there's any argument about that, how would we describe each other? When I do marital therapy, I'll often say, what words would you hope your husband or wife used to describe you? It gets dicey, by the way. What words would they actually use? But I want you to think about that when you make an impression. You see, not to put Gina on the spot, the moment Gina got up, right away there's a warm, welcoming feeling here. And I bet if you described her, you'd say, very caring person and whatever. Have you ever been in a class, not here at Harvard or any of the schools, where you walk in and right away what you feel is, this person doesn't even like teaching. He doesn't even like students. Oh, I always love it. I travel a lot. I go to a hotel. Some hotels, Dr. Brooks, how are you? How was your trip here? You know, an hour lady, come down. It's a big hotel, but how are you, Dr. Brooks? I say, oh, my God, they even know my name. <laughs> but sometimes you check into a hotel. After a minute, have you ever had this experience? You feel like saying, do you realize you're in a service industry, <laughs> and you should really smile <laughs> on that? Think about the impression. Would people gravitate to you? Would, would you be seen as a charismatic adult? But it's fair, as I'm very serious about this. So when you go home, what words do you hope others use to describe you? And it could be specific people. What do you say or do on a regular basis are likely to describe you that way? And what words do you think they would use? In psychology, some of the psychologists are now calling what they call TLCs. I thought it was tender, loving care or something. No, therapeutic lifestyle changes. I'm going to go through this quickly because you're probably tired of hearing about this. What we're looking at, it goes to personal control. What are things that you really have control over? Again, I'm not saying it's easy, but what are things you could do to lead a more resilient life, a more healthy life? I just selected a few. There are two articles on my website where I go over many more. You could almost guess this exercise. John Rady, a colleague of uh, mine, uh, he's a psychiatrist here in Boston, wrote a book called Spark. In that book, 
which I really highly recommend. I don't get any of his royalties, but I highly recommend. The first two or three chapters are about exercise in kids. Just to give you an example, in Naperville, Illinois, they looked at what would happen if kids came in and the first thing they did during the day is not sit at a desk or give, be given any academic work. Instead, you know what they did? They did aerobic exercise for 10 minutes. Do you know bullying went down, attendance went up? You know what's really sad as I go around the country? Because we're so into all these advanced classes. You know some of the first things that go in schools now? It's incredible to me. Phys ed. And I always love it. I work with a lot of kids with learning and attentional problems and hyperactivity. I always love it when I go to school and I hear this from a teacher. Oh, I had to keep this kid in from recess because he or she was not doing their work. And one teacher recently said to me, I, I thought it was a joke, but she wasn't. By the end of the day, he's off the wall. <laughs> I said, so would I be having you as a teacher? No, I really didn't <laughs> on that because I try to be very empathic about it. But you know what? But you know what? John has found even walking just 20, you know, 20, 25 minutes. We're not talking about preparing for decathlon. And it's a major thing. We have to build it in. And you know the sad thing with many of my adult patients when they get more depressed or anxious? Guess it's the first thing that seems to go? Exercise. I just don't have the energy. But that's when you really have to, to do it. In the book Spark, after he talks about kids, he gives some interesting data about how for a number of people, I'm not saying everyone, and medication certainly can help, but for a number of people, regular exercise is much more beneficial than anti-anxiety or anti-depressed you know, drugs. Oh, you're gonna, you're gonna know the next one, healthy diet. Okay, this is a little secret I wanna tell you. I exercise every day so I can eat chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> you know, we just have to be reasonable about it, I, you know, on this. Did the cookies arrive yet? I heard you usually have cookies. It's okay. I came here anyway. <laughs> well, we really do have to look at this. Look, the issue of obesity in kids is a major issue on this. But it also helps us in terms of being resilient. You feel healthier, you know, this, and meditation and mindfulness. This is very interesting. Any of you know the work of Richard Davidson? He's a neuroscientist. Richard Davidson, I had, I loved his work. Yo, you don't have to check about the cookies. Oh, okay. <laughs> Are there any chocolate? No, okay. <laughs> I've been reading his work, and I had the good fortune of presenting a back-to-back -back keynote with Richard Davidson. This is intriguing, his research. Also, like myself, he grew up in Brooklyn, so. Anyone here from Brooklyn, by the way? I knew it was a classy audience. Okay, at least one. <laughs> Richard Davidson has found this. In psychology, there's something called ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. A lot of research is taking place. Kids who have experienced a lot of adversity, that it actually stunts the development of the brain. Uh, you know. Richard Davidson at the University of Wisconsin actually has found this. If you involve young kids in giving to others, it actually activates parts of the brain that have not been activated before. If adults do it, it activates parts of the brain. So really, as Gina said, it's actually activating parts of the brain that have not been activated before. You know what's very encouraging to me? In the talk that he gave that I heard, he said, we must remember there's great plasticity in the brain. So it's not like, you know, at three or four, your path life is always this way. If you've had adverse childhood experiences. And the other thing he does, why I brought it up, he develops a kindness curriculum. These with four-year-olds. It would involve giving to others and altruism. He developed a kindness garden and also meditation. Now, I could imagine four-year-olds meditating. It's like probably I meditate. My meditation, any of you meditate would say, oh my God, he's like at a preschool level. I take a deep breath and I just exhale. I, if it makes me feel good. I think just like exercise in our schools, we should have more meditation and more schools are doing that. But we have to find ways of dealing with our stress. So TLCs basically look at what is it that we really may have some control over. 
By the way, do you need research for this? Isn't this make sense? <laughs> Moving right ahead. This directly ties to uh, what the season of giving and what Gina had mentioned is all about. I'll tell you when it first started. Many years ago, one of my first books looked at school climate. I was doing a book on how do you create schools where everyone really wants to be. And I decided what would happen if I gave a questionnaire to 50, it ended up to 1,500 people. Now I probably have about 4,000. And I'll just tell you the first question. Of all the memories you have of school, what is your favorite memory? So, and I wanted to know the impact of adults. Something an adult at the school said it did that boosted your motivation and your dignity. I wonder, what do people remember? I was stunned. Do you know what one of the most prominent memories was? I, never, I would have never guessed it, but little did I know, years later, I'd say, well, why not? When you were asked to help others. I got memories like this. I remember when a teacher asked me to pass out the milk and straws. I remember when a tutor asked me to tutor a younger child. And I'm, I remember the first time I was reading them, I was saying to my wife, holy cow, this is really incredible. But then I remember when my grandson, Teddy, was like four years old. I went to pick him up at preschool, and he hadn't read any of my books yet, so he didn't know. <laughs> so I said, how was school today, Teddy? You know, I was like, very good, Grandpa Bobby. I said, so what made it so good? I was appointed the line leader. <laughs> I'm so dumb sometimes. I said, What's a line leader? He looks at me, you lead the line. <laughs> he says, I hope they give me another thing like that tomorrow. <laughs> but we now know, at any age, one of the most important things, we heard Davidson's research, four-year-olds being altruistic, at almost any age, again, never where you're really feeling drained, but at almost any age, helping others, is one of the most vital kinds of, I, I would say, nutriments in being resilient. It's incredible. At, at a really almost, I'll say any age in this. As a matter of fact, many of you came to the talk that I give to parents. What I started saying to parents starting at three, four years old. You know what you should say to your kids? I say to my sons all the time, remember to do your chores. You know what I discovered? No one likes chores. <laughs> But when you say, I need your help, it is truly amazing, this power in the words we use. And so I started to think about this. And with my patients, I would be much more active in asking them, in what way do you feel you're making a difference? And some would say, I'm so exhausted, I have to take care of myself. But I would say, let's even select one little thing. I saw a woman in therapy who was very depressed. She always wanted to volunteer to tutor. And so she tutored, she volunteered at a school. I think it was worth 10 years of therapy. She said, I would walk away from there and I would feel so much better, you know, on that. So what brings meaning to our, you know, to our lives is a very powerful thing. With parents, I started, as I said, saying at an early age that go for, as families, go for walks for hunger, walks for AIDS, walks for your favorite charity. I don't care if your, your son or daughter walks three blocks, and then you say, you see, you're making a difference. We preach too much about kids being compassionate and caring. You got to be nice, you got to be this, but do we provide opportunities? As a matter of fact, I ask parents this question, because I'm very interested in how do you start developing compassion and caring and resilience? I say, if I were to interview your sons and daughters and ask them this question, and I'm going to use grown-up language. I wouldn't use this with a kid. What charitable activities have you seen your parents involved in in the last year? Could they tell me? One boy, oh, God, I felt so badly. He thought I was quizzing him. I guess I was. And he said, oh, oh, oh. And then he looks at me just with a big smile. I, said, I thought of something, Dr. Brooks. They write checks. Now, I'm not against writing checks for charities either. <laughs> but what do you do? And then I always like to ask. As a family, what charitable activities are you involved in? This is why it's so important, things like the season of giving. For me, the season of giving should be, of course, 12 months. But I more and more found that with my patients, when we could start having them feel they made a difference in the life of others, they were more resilient. 
this was also mentioned. Little did you know, you're going to mention it. Years ago, some psychologists, especially working with senior citizens, were very interested in this. They found that a number of senior citizens felt there was no purpose and meaning to their life anymore. They found they were useless. They had gotten more and more depressed. And I, I want to tell you what then they asked the, these senior citizens to do. If I had been involved, I probably would have said, oh, I don't think, I, and I tend to be optimistic. I don't know if this is going to work very well. But I want to tell you, it was so powerful. They simply asked them every night, it could be every other night, doesn't matter, write down two or three, three things you're grateful for. Just write down two or three things you're grateful for. If, again, if I was involved, I'd say that almost sounds like this forced thing. But what it did is it started to remind people there are things we are grateful for. And now they use a Martin Seligman, who I consider the father of you know, positive psychology in his classes at UPenn, will ask people to do that. He will ask his students to write a letter to a mentor or someone. As a matter of fact, would you suggest it? I would say this. Think about someone who has a major, because you'll hear the, see the next one, someone who has really had a, a major impact on your life, and how do we thank them? Think about the, who would be the charismatic adults in your life from whom you gathered strength, and how do we appreciate them, and how do we make a difference in their lives? So I, I must tell you, I, this one I've got to do more carefully. I see I do it too much on a reactive basis, and I'll tell you what I mean. If I've had a tough day, that's when I do it. I think you should do it even whether you've had a tough day or not. I remember one day, this was a few years ago. First, it was one of those days. Have you ever had a day where you feel like nothing has gone right? I felt none of my patients were doing very well or whatever. And I was supposed to babysit for my two grandkids who live a mile down the road from me in Needham, uh, Teddy, who I mentioned, and his sister, Lila. I, as a grandparent, I didn't even feel like going over to babysit. You could t tell how unhappy. So, but it's my duty. So I ring, you know, the doorbell. Lila, who's like all of like six, comes running. And she says, Grandpa Bobby, she jumps in my arms. I love you so much. I said, oh, my God. And I almost didn't come over on this. <laughs> That night, I sat, that night I sat down, I have no hesitation in telling you I was in tears. I said, I'm really grateful. You know, you forget some of the small things in life that are so important. I think, you know, if you don't want to write it down, just think about that. I'm, I'm grateful for, you know, for many things. And the last part, I hope I haven't gone too quickly, but <laughs> I know I'm zooming through this because I want to take pressure. I want this, I, I want to, yes, we have, I'll do this in a few minutes. Not only to what we're grateful for, but this is something which I hinted at, to express gratitude towards others, the impact of what I say, seemingly small gestures. One of the things in some research I did, I asked people about some of the most powerful moments in their life, both positive and negative. And what I discovered is some of the most powerful moments were very brief. It could have been just a quick comment someone made. And I must tell you, not just because I'm at a Harvard facility, but one, my, one of my be favorite journals in the last few years, it's not necessarily a psychology journal or an educational journal. It's the Harvard Business Review. I think they have had some of the best articles I have read on what we should be thinking about. They had a great article on what they call the emotional culture of organizations. It could be a school, it could be, a, you know, it could be a, a medical school, it could be a corporation. And one article I read said this, in the course of any day, they called it micro moments. See, I called it, I had called it seemingly small gestures. A micro moment is when someone says something to you, or smiles, or whatever it is, where you take it in and it's gonna have a lifetime impact. Now they refined it even more. They said micro moments could either be micro affirmations, those are good, where you affirm, or I love the micro aggressions. And then I realized in our lives we have many, many opportunities 
to create those micro moments. I still remember one after I finished my doctorate. Any of you, when you get a degree, say to yourself, I still don't know what I'm doing? <laughs> so I get my PhD in clinical psychology at Clark University in Worcester. And I said, oh my god. They're calling me doctor. I still don't know what I'm doing. That's why in all the training I've done of mental health professionals, you know what I say? Save the addresses of your first patients. And people sometimes say, why? I say, I'll tell you. Because after about five years, you're going to want to write them a letter. And you know what the letter would say? Dear so-and-so, I am so sorry. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I hope you turned out OK anyway. But uh, you know. So I decide, I say, I need more training. I loved it. My wife, who's very loving and direct, said, what have the last five years of graduate school been about? I'm so glib. I said, preparing me for more training. And I go out, and I'll just end with the story. I go out so to the University of Colorado Medical Center. I said, see a different part of the country. I loved it. And right away, I'm there only a month. Their, their grand rounds attracted like 150 people, 200 people. They select one of my patients to discuss which of course means I have to discuss the patient. I wasn't used to standing up and speaking. And I told my supervisor, Hirsch Berkowitz, I said, could they select another patient? He said, no. It's... And he, he said, don't worry, I'll help you with it. And he really helps me with the preparation. I go there that day. I am so nervous. <laughs> I'm really nervous. And because you know, all I'm thinking of is, you screw up, and you're going to see these people for the next 11 months here, it's postdoc. I thought the presentation went okay, but I wasn't certain. And uh, you know, you're never quite certain. And I had to run out right afterwards. Later that afternoon, when I got to my office, there was a little folded up note. And the folded up note, I call it like the five second note. It was written by Hirsch, and this is what he said. You did a great job today, Bob. Guess what I did with that note? folded it up, and I put it in my wallet. It was like a security blanket. And I realized then there are these little gestures we make where we express you know, certain great, give positive feedback that help us so much. And so these ideas, I think that they're all doable. I know how hard it is, having seen so many patients of all ages. But someone once said to me, and this is the final thought, and I'll take a question. Someone once said to me, you have, I, it was a real compliment. You have some wonderful ideas. And then they said, but they're not easy to do. And you know what I said? I'll leave you with this thought. You think what I suggested today is not easy? What's not easy is not doing any of them. Because then you'll see what the alternative is. So I hope there's a lot of food for thought. Thank you for being so attentive. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And we have about 10 minutes for questions, I guess. Oh, questions already. Oh, wow. <laughs> what resilience techniques can be used to help manage stress during medical school exams? <laughs> Gee, I wonder how that question. Do you know the very notion, even reading this, I just got anxious, uh, just reading this. I, I, what I'm going to say is not necessarily helpful, because exams are exams. I, I remember at graduate school, two weeks, what they call preliminary exams. And if you did not pass them, you could not go on for your dissertation. So they meant a lot. What, what I would say now is, first of all, the thing, one is to be very r proactive. and. What really started helping me in graduate school was to realize I could not just study a week or two before. I spent a whole summer going over it so that I could really prepare myself. Another thing is, that is one of the times I really started to exercise when I felt it was very, you got to build in times where you could exercise. The other thing is, I also built in actually, my wife and I built in times where I, I actually went out more with friends than less because I said, You've, you know, you really have to enjoy life on that, because <laughs> part of it was out of anxiety when I, uh, <laughs> I said, because if you don't pass these exams, you're not going anywhere <laughs> on that. So there are things, but we, you know, we all learn our own techniques. I started exercising more. 
I started actually going out more, not less. And I really, lear learning, speaking to other students, I said, I'm going to start studying three months in advance for these. And it was always my way of almost overlearning. But if someone comes into my office, I would say to them in things like, in the past, what has helped with stress? So you learn from that. What are the things that could be helpful? And if people tell me they can't build it in, I say, you're going to waste more time being anxious. Again, none of this is e uh, easy, having gone through many exams. I'm so glad I'm finished with most of those exams. <laughs> I am finished with all of them. Uh, How would you advise someone with OCD? Are there resilience techniques that can help? This is a, a wonderful question. When I worked at McLean Hospital, they had a, uh, a, a Mass General a, a, a clinic for OCD. And there it's a combination of things. And I may not be the expert. Some people did need medication. And then there are different techniques. I want to talk about it from a resilience model. The more we could learn different techniques that people use, you know, how to try to stop these thoughts. I once worked with a woman who had obsessive compulsive disorder. She would have to, like, she always was convinced she left the, the uh, burner on and the stove and whatever. Now, this may sound crazy, but one of the things that really helped is we made a list of all the things she worried about. So before she went out, when she was locking the door, it, it was built in. I said, before you lock the door, go to check if you've uh, left on the burner. I actually asked her to do the very things that caused her great anxiety, but now she felt a sense of control. It's not going to work, for, you know, certainly for everyone, but my whole feeling is when you feel you're not in control, what are some of the things you could do to help you, you know, feel you are in control? With her, it worked wonders. Any, any anxiety? Did I lock my car? It was in the garage, but maybe she came from New York like I did, so, you know, you lock it everywhere. I, I would say, as you're ready to go into the house, go back to the car, see if you locked it. So actually, what you're doing is prescri what they call in prescribing the symptom, if you will. But she had a sense of you know, control over that. We could, we could spend hours uh, on this. Oh, hi. Hi. Thank you so very much for your words of wisdom. Oh, thank you. Very inspiring. Oh, thank you. What are your comments about uh, mindfulness and meditation? There's comparison and contrast, relative value, et cetera. Oh, well, first of all, I'm not, the, you, you heard that I'm at a preschool level with uh, meditation. I just feel reading Davidson's work, and there's a, a pediatrician I met, Mark Burton, who's written some wonderful books of work for parents of children with special needs, helping them to be less stressed. And as I'm reading more, I see different people use different uh, techniques. For me, it's being you know, present at the moment and some people are much more successful than others. When I first started reading about it, I must tell you, I said, oh, God, this is going to work. But I even find, as I mentioned, especially if I've been writing all day or seen a couple of patients who have been very challenging, I just find it's just very helpful for me to sit back and literally just, it's just two or three minutes. Some of you probably are much more expert at it than I am. I will literally close my eyes. I'll just take some deep breaths. That's one of the things I read in Google 101 or something, a meditation. And I find it really helps on that. And then now looking at the research like Davidson's that is actually has to activating parts of the brain that, you know, I, I think it's something we can all learn. I wish, I love visiting schools and you see, I, I love it. These kindergarten kids, they're sitting. I don't know what that meditation is, but they are really more relaxed. So it's very intriguing to me to see that one exercise can be very helpful to help kids prepare for school or anything. And that's why in the question to the answer about the stress of medical tests, I'm wondering if aerobic exercise either before meditation, because that's what they're starting to look at. If you, if you have exercise before you're going to take an exam, can it be helpful? I'm waiting to hear some of the results that way. But these are all what we call now therapeutic lifestyle changes. You can learn it. You can do it. And nowadays, my God, you, you could go on YouTube. You could see 50 different kinds of meditation. What do we do before Google and YouTube? I have no idea on that. Oh, oh, OK. I hope I answered it in part. Hello? Here. Oh, oh, 
I'm sorry. Oh, you, all, you can go ahead. <laughs> well, that was really. I, 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 go ahead. I'm I know sorry. you use the word happiness a lot, and people have different definitions of happiness, and some people even question whether it, there is a definition of happiness. What's your take on happiness? Okay. Like, what, what? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, probably the book that had the greatest impact on me in terms of happiness was Sean Aker's book, The Happiness Advantage. Sean Aker got his doctorate at Harvard, he had positive psychology, highly recommended. Let me tell you, his definition is, well, I must tell you, when I first read his book, my first thought was, let's just post those happy faces throughout Harvard Medical School, or, you know, Harvard. Uh, and all I could think about, I'll quickly tell you this, my granddaughter, Lila, sends, I loved how my grandkids texted before I did. She sends me a text, Dear Grandpa Bobby, I love you so much, 50 smiling faces. I thought she was a genius. I said to my wife, look at this. My wife says, they're called emojis. <laughs> so I write her back. I said, I love you too. 60 smiley faces. Once I knew how to do it, I mean, it wasn't. Right away, she writes back, me too, 75. At that point, I said so. <laughs> but Sean Aker's definition is one that uh, ties to what I've said. He says, positive emotions uh, basically, happiness is a positive emotions with a sense of purpose and meaning. The moment I read that book, which is about eight years old, what I think about, what he is saying is positive emotions then also have to be, it's not just saying be happy, positive emotions then lead to also certain things where he then talks about giving to others in a sense of purpose. This went right along with everything I thought. And then in his book, he gives so many different examples. As a matter of fact, yesterday I was in my old haunting grounds of Brooklyn, New York, speaking to educators and mental health professionals. I t told the teachers, your first job is not, to, is not to teach reading or science or math. Your first job is to ask this, how do I create positive emotions in a classroom? Because then students will be much more able to learn from you. Right away, we go into academics in some schools. That's crazy. We have to figure out, how do you create those emotions? I went into psychology. This is a very personal story. I'll quickly tell you, I was a business major. I switched to psychology as a senior at City College of New York. Why? Because of a professor named John Bauer. Because I, I finally had to take a social science class. I have ended up taking his. Within 10 minutes, I told yesterday's group, within 10 minutes, I knew two things. He loved what he was teaching. And any of you have had an introductory psych class, you know that they are there to dissuade you from going into psychology. <laughs> and I knew something else. That's why I love your question. I knew he loved students. And looking back, he created a positive emotions that was so critical. So my note it would be really positive emotions. And there's, I'll just mention Barbara Fredrickson wrote a book called Positivity where she has a whole theory which she says, and, and it impacts on the brain, positive emotions lead you to be more creative, better problem solvers, and whatever. Because we, if there are too many people, if we're in a situation, we're more worried about looking foolish than being able to take risks. So uh, there are a couple of articles on my website that, uh, about my view of happiness, but it's not just a smiling face, but that helps too. One final question. Hi. First of all, thank you so much. I really have enjoyed your time. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and I was thinking about what you said about uh, people, in, you know, with adverse experiences in their childhood, et cetera, really tough circumstances, um, finding a charismatic adult. And it occurs to me that it's hard for me to believe that the world is divided into you know, people who found one and people who didn't. So I'm wondering, you know, is it about stony ground? Is it about the fact that um, some people, uh, many of us actually, hear the negative more than the positive and maybe didn't respond to the adults? I don't know, yeah. you know, I'm just curious. Well, one, I, I would never have a, you know, a polarity of, you know, either your charismatic adult, oh, I know. Or, you know, in that yeah. regard. What your question invites, and I'll say, because I know we're running out of time, but what your question uh, invites uh, is, is this. There are some people who I feel have gone through adversity. I didn't even get into the issue of temperament. We know from birth some people are more likely to be resilient. So one of the things is I think there are some people with all the adversity they faced 
when they meet other people, it's almost, you know what their message is? I am ready for you to be my charismatic adult. And they're accepting. There are some people, and look, when I was at McLean, kids with attachment disorders, kids who have been abused, they would have loved it, but they, 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 right now it's not within their ability. That's why I started saying even children need our love the most when they often seem to deserve it the least, that we have to stick with them. So your question, <laughs> is this the ninth time I've said that? We could spend an hour on that particular question on this. Michael Rudder, the famed British psychiatrist who was one of the first to study resilience, he looked at some factors. You know what he said? Some of the two, thing, two things he mentioned that help people to be resilient is and meet their charismatic adults. One is military service. Because for some people, it brings a certain discipline and a relationship that they need. And you know what he said the other was? And a good marriage. And then you have to know Michael Rudd, if you've ever heard him speak you know, with this lovely British accent, which of course I can't do. And then he says, but how you get into a good marriage is a whole other issue, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. But I've been intrigued, that's why, again, with your question, I've been intrigued by how some people are much more open to accepting charismatic adults. Some people, it's easier for them to be charismatic adults. Uh, but I guess working with a number of people either who, of any age who felt forced into therapy or forced, in, f forced into something, how can I create those positive emotions, getting to the question, you know, that were how could I create those positive emotions where they could start feeling comfortable with you? And uh, again, we could spend hours, uh, this, well, it's my passion, it's 40 years of work here, so thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for your very kind.